Live from Las Vegas, the entertainment capital of the world, it's the Joe Cortez Show. Well, welcome to the Fair but Firm Show here in Las Vegas, Nevada. And of course, on Tuesday, we call it the Joe Cortez Show. Everybody's been following us, Fair but Firm, throughout the world, from my boxing days when I was a referee. But here we are today trying to do something a little different. We're trying to get a Jackie Nunes, who's be our co-host on the show today. We have some technical difficulties, so I'll be straightforward. I'm going to call the show by myself today unless we get her on the air. Anyway, to make a long story short, I wanted to have Jackie Nunes on the show because I come up with a concept of trying to do uh, music, uh, entertainment, and uh, boxing on the radio talk show which we're going to try to do a little sample on the, on the air today. It would have been like Muhammad Ali, Roberto Duran, Marvin Hagler, Oscar De La Hoya, Mike Tyson, Julio Cesar Chavez, Manny Pacquiao. Just to name a few of the fighters that we were going to have on. These fighters were singers in their days as well, besides being uh, boxers. But I can tell you one thing, that the radio talk show that we're going to be uh, showing in the, uh, this coming spring will be about music, and uh, the era of the fighter. Let's say Muhammad Ali was fighting back in the 60s. We had some great songs, uh, even of him singing Stand By Me, a song that was actually a uh, very popular song, but Muhammad Ali sang it himself, and uh, it was amazing. You had Roberto Duran singing his songs, in Latin songs with the salsa music, and you had Roberto Duran. Uh, we had uh, Oscar De La Hoya. We have uh, Manny Pacquiao. You all know that Manny Pacquiao loves music. And these guys have yeah, tremendous uh, voices. Not that they're going to be superstars in the, in the music industry, but they are very talented. And, of course, the fans will say, well, they, they're pretty good. Only the fans will say that. Real, true fans that really love them. Anyway, but at home, the fans, were, the, the family tell them, come on, keep, 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 keep boxing. You know, give yourself another job. Forget about the, uh, the music business. But it's so entertaining to see these guys out there trying to do something else which is very entertaining to see uh, fighters with uh, multi-talented. Uh, anyway, um, but Jackie Nunes is a DJ back in New York, and she's been doing uh, in the music industry for over 35 years. And I talked to her about the idea of combining the music and the boxing together, and she said, wow, Joe, that, that's something I never heard of in my whole career. I mean, never, this is something unique, you know, putting boxing, music and having guests, uh, fighters uh, and entertainers, singers themselves, musicians, all on the show at any given time to do the show like twice a week here in Las Vegas, the entertainment capital of the world. And Jackie Nunes, who's uh, going to be moving on in her career, coming out to the entertainment capital here to Las Vegas, we thought it would be a great idea to put such a show together. Anyway, I can tell you that uh, with the boxing world, it's something new, something that the fans would, uh, would love to see because it's something definitely very, very different. Anyway, and talking about boxing, this coming weekend, we have uh, Mikey Garcia, who's fighting Earl Spence Jr. And that fight will be on pay-per-view Saturday afternoon, Saturday night. And that fight is coming from uh, uh, Texas. And it could, it's a big fight because Mikey Garcia is going up two divisions to challenge one of the best welterweights in the world today, Earl Spence Jr. Earl Spence Jr. is known to be uh, the boogeyman in the welterweight division because he's, uh, they call him the truth, but real people in boxing, the other fighters, they call him the boogeyman. He's so dangerous. He's a southpaw that brings a lot of talent uh, into the ring. He definitely has it all. He's the IBF uh, welterweight champion. And Mikey Garcia has been a champion in four different weight classes, coming up from featherweight, lightweight, uh, super lightweight, and uh, actually featherweight, lightweight, uh, super featherweight, and now he is challenging at the 147 class. It's going to be very amazing, even though people don't give him a chance because he's a lot smaller going up two divisions. But back in the old days, boxing, the fighters would fight, let's say a featherweight would fight a lightweight, a lightweight would challenge a welterweight champion. So it is not new in the old, in the yesteryears, but it's happening now with these two fighters Coming up, I got to take my hat off to uh, Mikey Garcia, who's brave enough to challenge one of the best out there in the welterweight division. Never mind the, the fighters in his weight class, but you got fighters that are uh, saying yeah, they don't want to fight Earl Spence Jr. Even some of the welterweight, you got uh, Keith Thurman, you got Manny Pacquiao, 
You got so many fighters out there that are looking to uh, move up in uh, in, uh, in weight class, but to fight one of the best is kind of hard in boxing. But I can tell you that uh, that's what brings uh, uh, boxing alive. People say that boxing is dead. Not when you got fights like this coming weekend. And it's probably one of the first few uh, pay-per-view events of the year. And of course, you know, we have in Secret of Mayu weekend, we have Canelo Alvarez, who's one of the highest paid fighters in the history of boxing, I mean, he got a deal for 11 fights for $365 million. Now, Canelo Alvarez, you guys know, it. that was the last fight I refereed was Canelo Alvarez against Jose Lito Lopez in 2012. After that, I decided to retire after 35 years. But you got Canelo Alvarez challenging, actually, he's fighting Danny Jacobs. They call him the miracle man because Danny Jacobs was a, is a cancer survivor and came up, I knew him from the amateur ranks, came up and became a, a, a world champion in the middle, middleweight division. And now Canelo Alvarez, who is the middleweight champion, after beating Triple G, Janity Golovkin uh, last year, and now we're surprised, even Danny Jacobs himself was surprised that Canelo Alvarez chose him as his next opponent because, honestly, uh, he is one of the toughest middleweights out there. Danny Jacobs uh, lost the titles, and uh, when he got beat by... Uh, Triple G, Jenny Golovkin, even though a lot of fans felt that Danny Jacobs won the fight. And here we are now, come Cinco de Mayo weekend, on my, uh, May 4th, it's a Saturday, and that fight will be taking place here in Las Vegas at the T-Mobile Arena. It's a must-watch fight because Canelo Alvarez has his hands full for this kind of a fight. But uh, I can tell you that boxing is very much alive, and people are saying that uh, what's going on with boxing. Most recently, you had... Uh, uh, the heavyweight division, Tyson Fury, who fought Deontay Wilder for a very, very exciting heavyweight fight. And the people say, what happened to Anthony Joshua, the British fighter, the heavyweight champion in Great Britain? They wanted to see him against Deontay Wilder. Well, they haven't been able to get to the table. They've been trying to negotiate, but one wants more than the other. These guys are, I mean, they're getting big money. These guys are talking about $80 million, $100 million for, per fight. Back in the old days when Muhammad Ali was fighting, he was making maybe three, four, five million dollars at the most. And these guys had to dust chump change for these fighters today to be uh, fighting for five or six million dollars. They, 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 they're walking away from, from 50 million dollars, 60 million dollars. No, they want 100 million. But it'll happen eventually with the heavyweight division. It's really gearing up to be one of the, the coming back in the hotbed of boxing, the heavyweight, the glamour division in boxing. And I can tell you that I, myself, when I started refereeing back in the days, back in the 70s, we had the, uh, that was the golden era of boxing. That's where you had the middleweights. You had Marvin Hagler. You had uh, so many great fighters. Uh, Tyson came up in the 80s. You had uh, uh, Larry Holmes, Muhammad Ali. You had Roberto Duran, Marvin Hagler, Tommy Hearns. We're talking about these guys in the welterweight middleweight division, the heavyweight division. The heavyweight division always seemed to have, you know, had the, 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 the glory of boxing. You go to Madison Square Garden to watch the heavyweight fight and go to a fashion show. You would see everybody come out there, women and the men come out there with their mink coats and the mink hats and everybody with the cigars walking into Madison Square Garden. You thought you were going to one of the biggest uh, fashion shows that you've ever seen, but they were coming to a boxing match. And that's the way it was back in the days. And of course, when Muhammad Ali passed the torch on to uh, Larry Holmes, and then Larry Holmes, uh, I remember fighting when he fought Mike Tyson, of which I was a referee. You know, it, sometimes I got to pinch myself. And uh, today, I, uh, I said to myself, I can't believe I went through a referee all those fights with all these great ones. But in honor of Muhammad Ali the greatest, I had this ring on. Uh, Muhammad Ali, this is a Muhammad Ali heavyweight championship ring. It's a replica of an Ali heavyweight championship ring of which I'm so honored to wear the show today because Muhammad Ali, Ali has been the greatest in boxing, always considered the greatest, even though there are other fighters that say, I was the greatest, and the other one, I'm the greatest, but Muhammad Ali, he really talked his mouth off when he told you the fans, I was the greatest even when he was in the amateurs coming up at the Olympics. So here he is, he's gone, he's in heaven now with the other great uh, fighters, and they're having a good time looking down and saying, man, you guys got to keep up with us. Those guys were really great. 
Joe Fraser, Muhammad Ali, Rocky Marciano, Joe Lewis, Jersey Joe Walcott, just to name a few, Jake LaMotta. I mean, those guys, I bet Sugar Ray Robinson, who was probably the greatest of all time in my book, he was a middleweight champion. He, him and Jake LaMotta fought six times. And Jake LaMotta used to tell me, Joe, uh, you know, I fought Sugar Ray Robinson six times. I fought him so many times, it, it, was like a, it was like a dream. I couldn't believe I was fighting this guy over and over again. People love those kind of fights. It was like the fights, Muhammad Ali and Joe Fraser, the, the, the trilogy of those fights. One was so great, they followed the second one, and the last one was the trilogy in Manila, with Ali finally stopping Joe Fraser. It was tough. Just like uh, Manny Pacquiao when he fought uh, Eric Morales. They fought three times. And you got uh, Michael Antonio Barrera, who fought Eric Morales three times. And you have Manny Pacquiao, who fought... Uh, Oh, man, he fought so many fighters. Uh, Juan Manuel Marquez, they fought four times. I refereed the first one, where Marquez went down three times in the first round, and everybody said, wow, is it? Joe's going to stop it. I didn't stop it because I saw something left in Manny Pacquiao's eyes. When I looked at him, he went down the third time. I said, I'm going to let it continue. It was only the first round. And I probably the best decision I ever made in boxing was that decision, not stopping that fight, because if I would have stopped the first fight, they would have never fought the second, the third, and the fourth one. Now, the fourth one, Marquez finally got even, because the second and the third, even they got a draw the first one, even though he got dropped three times. He got a draw. Because of that draw, he, they gave him a rematch. The rematch, a lot of fans thought that Marquez won, but they gave it to Pacquiao. Then for the third time, again, a lot of fans thought that Marquez won, they gave it to Pacquiao. Well, they fought the fourth time, and you know what happened? Pacquiao got knocked out cold. He went right on his face, down with a wicked right hand that one man that Marcus hit him with. Talking about memory lane, wow. I thought that was it for Manny Pacquiao. But you know what? Manny Pacquiao today is still the welterweight champion of the world. He became a welterweight champion time after time. People thought he was out, finished, he comes back. And most recently, you know, he beat uh, Adrian Broner and, and, and took that welterweight champion, uh, retained the welterweight championship. I mean, he is unbelievable. He's 40 years young. I can't say 40 years old because some fighters look old at, at 30. This man is 40 years young. He fought like a young fighter back in the days. I remember when I first referee Manny Pacquiao when he was a bantamweight, 118 pounder. Here he is, went, went up to become, he, weighed, he won championship in eight different weight classes and came back and now stayed with the welterweight He's, he's short, he's not that big, but he got to stop guys like Oscar De La Hoya. I mean, he's, he's unbelievable. He fought some of the great ones, fought Miguel Cotto. Fought, I mean, he's, he's, he looks superb over all these great fighters, definitely all Hall of Famers. And Manny Pacquiao definitely is a Hall of Famer. First time around, when it comes to the election of the, being nominated to the Hall of Fame, believe me, Manny Pacquiao, on the first round, he'll be, he'll be nominated for the Hall of Fame. Now, we know that the Filipinos out there have had some great fighters in the past. Flash Lorde was one, and you had Brian Veloria was another one. But, you know, you had guys out there that, actually, Brian Veloria is from Hawaii, but you have uh, Jesus Salute was also another Filipino fighter. And you had other great ones uh, from the, the Philippines, but Manny Pacquiao stands out to be like the best of all Filipino fighters, and not only Filipinos, but worldwide. Manny Pacquiao brings a lot of talent to boxing. Now, we, let's go down memory lane. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Mike Tyson. I remember Mike Tyson uh, fighting as a young kid. I remember he came up to me one day when he was 13 years of age. He said, Mr. Cortez, I want to be a fighter. I'm in the amateurs now, and I want to try to be something in boxing. I told him, young man, if you do the right things in life, you can make it. You can end up being heavyweight champion of the world but you have to live a clean life. You have to dedicate yourself, be focused, and be a lot of discipline to make it in the world of boxing. You don't make it in boxing unless you really have it in the heart and in your mind and be focused and be, try to be the, the right kind of person in life, and you'll make it. And you know what? He did. And I had the honor of refereeing Mike Tyson on nine different occasions. And one of, one of the fights that I remember of Mike Tyson that I refereed was when he knocked out... Uh, Oh, my God, he knocked out Larry Holmes. 
Larry Holmes, like within four or five rounds, it was over in Atlantic City. It was, it was sad to see a, a, a legend like Larry Holmes getting knocked out by an up-and-coming young fighter, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson became heavyweight champion, the youngest heavyweight champion in the world. And then one day in Japan, he went over there to fight a fighter that was, that was really not a, a top-notch fighter. I don't even consider that he was a, cont a top contender, but they matched him against uh, Buster Douglas. Buster Douglas was really, he was a 40 to one underdog. A lot of fans felt like, well, uh, this fella, uh, Michael uh, uh, Douglas is not, not Michael Douglas, <laughs> uh, Buster Douglas, Michael Douglas is the actor. <laughs> anyway, so he went and fought uh, Tyson, and what did he do, beat a 41 underdog? He knocks out Mike Tyson. And I remember that night when Tyson had Buster Douglas down, in the, I believe it's in the fifth round, the referee instead of picking up the count from the timekeeper, the timekeeper was at five, the referee picked up the count as one. And it was wrong. He should have picked it up at six, seven. When the timekeeper got his hand at five, you pick it up from the timekeeper, and then you six, seven, eight, nine, ten, Douglas would have been out. But no, he beat that, he picked it up at one, Douglas beat the count, got up, and ended up and several rounds later, knocking out Mike Tyson. So, I mean, it was a, a fight to, to be remembered because one of the greatest, uh, one of the biggest upset in the history of the heavyweight division in boxing. But that's uh, one, of the th one of the things about Mike Tyson. I'm, so doing, refereeing him against um, uh, Larry Holmes was, was a great experience for me. And of course, refereeing his last fight against Kevin McBride in Washington, D.C. They called me to referee that fight. And I, it was sad because for me to be in the ring with one of the great ones of all times, and uh, be that I already had refereed eight of his other fights in the past, here we are refereeing his last fight. And uh, you know, it was sad to see him uh, take the pounding that he took in the late rounds. He was trying so much to knock out Kevin McBride. Uh, Mike Tyson was favored to win that night, but Kevin McBride came ready as, as ever and to great condition. And he outbeat Tyson because Tyson just didn't have it. He, he, he gassed out. He didn't have nothing in the tank. So I, had to, I ended up stopping the contest in the sixth round, at the end of the sixth round, when Tyson went over to the corner, walking to his corner. Actually, at the bell, with the bell side at the end of the fifth round, at the end of the sixth round, he got pushed and Tyson went down and uh, the bell sounded. So I, I, I'm not supposed to put my hand on the fire to help get him up. So you know, I was standing there waiting for Mike Tyson to get up. The bell already had sounded. So he has to get up on his own. He got up. When he got up, I said to myself, this guy can't go anymore. He doesn't have it. He's just winded. I walked him over to the corner. And I remember the great featherweight champion who was his trainer that night, Jeff Fennick, he said, Joe, that, that's it. We've got to stop it. And I waved it off and stopped it there. But I remember during that course of that fight, I think it was in the fifth round, I remember Mike Tyson headbutt Kevin McBride intentionally. And you know what? Kevin McBride uh, was trying to hold him, hold his arm. Mike Tyson was twisting the arm. They were in the clinches. It got a little bit of, you know, out of control, but where I felt that I, I have to do something in this fight. I have to uh, take control. And he headbutted him. Kevin McBride cut him. And I ended up taking a point from Mike Tyson for the intentional headbutt. And I knew already Mike Tyson was, uh, was in bad shape because that's when you start freaking out and Mike Tyson are using the head to do anything to stop the momentum of Kevin McBride. And when I took that point, I took Mike Tyson by the wrist and I took him up to the judges. I said, all right, point. What point deduction? Point deduction. And I looked at Mike Tyson. He looked at me. And I looked in his face and said, Mike, you can't be doing that. Then I covered my ears real quick. I want to make sure he didn't bite my ears off. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, this is not a comedy show. This is just telling you the, the true facts. That's how I felt. When I took that point, I said, man, make sure he didn't, he didn't come and attack me. Because Mike had a, the tendency of losing control sometimes in our ring. And I made sure that didn't happen that night. But that was his last fight. And I, I, I took my hat off to Mike Tyson and said, you know, Mike, you had a great run. You did a lot of good things for boxing. And even today, I, when I see him, I, I come up to him, I shake his hand. He always respects me. When you guys see on YouTube, it says, Mike Tyson knocked out Joe Cortez. That is not me there, please. I got never knocked out by anyone. I was never a heavyweight. I'm still a middleweight. Come on, guys. Everybody said, Joe Cortez gets knocked out by Mike Tyson. They got so many thousands of hits. I think over, 
I don't know, hundreds of thousands of hits on YouTube. No, it wasn't me. Even though you probably want to see me get knocked out by Mike Tyson, but I'm too fast for him. I never got hit by Mike Tyson, okay? But anyway, we have a lot of fun talking about those great days. I remember the great, one of the great fights I refereed with Roberto Duran. Roberto Duran against Iran Barkley. That was back in 1989 in Atlantic City. We had three feet of snow that day. I was smart enough to take off early from Yonkers, New York, when I was li where I was living, and I drove up to Atlantic City, and I remember taking uh, Benji Estevez, one of our world-renowned boxing referees today. I he was going with me to Atlantic City, and I said, Benji, you know, we're leaving early. He said, why so early in the morning? I said, believe me, it's going to be a big snowstorm. By the time we got there, there was three feet of snow in New York City. Even in Atlantic City, it was about two and a half feet of snow. So uh, it's a big snowstorm, and that fight that night, I ran Barkley, middleweight champion of the world, in his prime, had just come off a knockout from, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Tommy Hearns. My, uh, I, t I can tell you, one of the greatest fights I ever because Dur Roberto Duran was 35 years of age. He was one of the great lightweight champions of all times. He, he went up to welterweight champion, beat, uh, took the title from uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, then he went up and fought Davey Moore at Madison Square Garden and knocked him out, taking the 154 Super Welterweight Championship. And then he goes up at the age of 35 to challenge uh, Iran Barkley for the middleweight championship of the world. And what happened that night? It was a war. If you guys get a chance, watch that fight on YouTube and you'll see how great Roberto Duran looked that night at the age of 35. Everybody said, he's finished. I mean, Tommy Hearns knocked him out. Come on, he, he, he has nothing left. But he showed one of his better performances that night, becoming the middleweight champion of the world with a split decision over Iran Barkley. And had Barkley down in the 11th round. I thought Barkley was not going to get up. I gave him the count. He made it. They went the distance 12 rounds. That's one of the other great fights. And of course, you want to talk about some other great fights that I referee. How about Julio Cesar Chavez against Oscar De La Hoya? That fight was a fight without, I call it a fight, uh, passing of the torch. That's one of the great uh, junior uh, welterweight, 140 pound champion, Julio Cesar Chavez, fighting Oscar De La Hoya, who was an Olympic champion and was up in the uh, way, became lightweight champion. Now he's challenging uh, Chavez for the super. Uh, lightweight championship, 140 pounds, and that's when Oscar De La Hoya was able to stop Chavez on a cut on the eyebrow. It, very, it was about two and a half, three inches wide. It was pretty deep. He hit him with a jab in the first round, and I saw some blood coming out of the sun. It was blood splattered all in his face. You know, I called time out, and I bring him to the doctor, uh, Dr. Flip on match. He looked at it. He said, it's okay, let it continue. That was the first round. The second round, he kept getting Hit, his vision was impaired by the punches, by the blood. So he, all the punches he was getting hit by, by Oscar De La Hoya is something that never happened to Chavez before. Then in the third round, I called I call a doctor in again to check him out. I called timeout. Dr. Olmaski, what do you think? Okay. The next round, I called Dr. Uh, the fourth round. I called Dr. Flip Olmaski during the round. I said, timeout. Doctor, check him out again. He taking, he, he's getting hit a lot. The vision had been impaired. I thought Mansky looked at it. He said, okay, that's it, Joe, stop it. And I stopped. I waved it off. What a big surprise at boxing. The Mexican fans and the fans all over the world were so surprised to see the great Julio Cesar Chavez lose a defeat to a young Oscar De La Hoya. And that was the beginning of Oscar De La Hoya's career as a top notch. I believe he was like a five-time world champion in different weight classes. And Oscar De La Hoya today has a Golden Boy promotion. He's doing very well with his promotional company. So those are all, some of the other fights that are great ones that I referee. And of course, I referee Julio Cesar Chavez against Penel Whitaker at the Alamo Dome in Texas. And that was a fight that the fans to this day say, Joe, who really won that fight? They ended up a draw. Everybody felt that Whitaker won the fight uh, easily, but they call it a draw. I always say, you know what, fans? I wasn't scoring. I was just doing my job, trying to keep uh, control of the fight. And I remember when I tried to break him up, uh, Whitaker kind of pushed my hand when I was breaking him up. I said, hey, wait, time out. Don't be pushing me. And I pushed him back. Don't push me. You know, I mean, I could have made a big stink of it. I didn't want to. He wasn't pushing me intentionally. He was pushing my arm out of the way so he could get at Chavez. So I took all of that in consideration. I don't want to take any point because a fight like this or this magnitude it was really nothing that no damage was done, so I just let it go for a strong warning. But these are the kind of fights sometimes as a referee, 
you have to have be uh, level-headed. Something may go wrong. You know what? No big deal. It's another day. I may think you keep on doing your job. And anything we do in life, whether it's behind the cameras, whether it's the engineers, something goes wrong with the guests, we don't get things going right. It's not no fault of our people here. Sometimes it happens. You know what? Am I going to get upset? Hell no. It's just us life. You know what? We have other shows next week. And uh, so that's where it goes. That's how it goes, guys. One of the other great fights I did, who is the Chavez against Greg Haugen? The one of the largest crowd of boxing history, if not the largest crowd, 136,000 fans in Stadium Azteca. Greg Haugen from Henderson, Nevada, for Chavez. He, he said, Chavez, you ain't nothing but a bum. He said, you fought a bunch of Tijuana taxi drivers. That's how you got all that big record, so many knockouts. I'm going to knock you out. But you know what happened? Chavez was so upset. When I gave him the instruction, he didn't want to touch gloves with, uh, with Haugen. He wanted to just get, kick his butt. So I gave him the instruction. He didn't want to touch gloves. I made, I wouldn't make sure. I got Chavez by the hand and by the glove and made sure he touched uh, uh, Haugen's glove to make sure that I want good sportsman like conduct. But you know what? With the first round, Chavez started punching, bam, 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 put Haugen down the first round. Haugen gets up. Chavez could have finished him off, but you know what Chavez wanted to do? He wanted to punish him. So he punished him for another four or five rounds before finally. Uh, I had to jump in and stop it. I don't want uh, Hogan to take any unnecessary punishment. But I was thinking to myself, wow, can you imagine all these fans here? They were 136,000. I think the only fan there that was rooting for Hogan was his trainer. And other than that, can you imagine if I would have to stop Chavez for taking a pounding from Hogan? I said, they'd probably take me and, and lynch me in the middle of that ring. Well, all, all these fans, they were like 136,000, unbelievable. But anyway, that's some of those fights I'm talking about, old memory lane, the good days. And I remember going now to the day. The big day was in 2011, the induction of the International Boxing Hall of Fame. And you know what? I never got into boxing uh, as a fighter as a, in the Hall of Fame, but I made it in the back door as a referee. I got inducted into the Hall of Fame with who? Julio Cesar Chavez, Mike Tyson, Sylvester Stallone, Casa Zhu, the and uh, National Berman Spring. And of course, it was a great year, 2011. It was an honor for me. To this day, I still got a pitch myself. So I can't believe I got to where I got to in boxing. To our friends out there, Jackie Nunes in New York, hope to have you on the show next time around. We'll be talking about what we're going to be doing with the radio station called The Champs. Okay? The Champs is a group called, uh, there was, had a song called uh, Tequila. But that's the name of the show, The Champs, because Jackie and I will be the champs on the show. Talk to you next week. Protect yourselves at all time. God bless. And remember, I'm fair, but I'm firm. Take care.